Hey everybody, this is Nate Picos of Blambot, and welcome to a Lettering Live Spotlight on the Ain't No Grave logo. So Ain't No Grave is a project by Scotty Young and Jorge Corona that's being published by Image. And the solicitations just came out that reveal the logo and the cover, and so I can finally talk about this process a little bit. So before we begin, you'll notice that all these files I'm going to show you are in black and white. And that's sort of a throwback to a professor I had in college who you like to say that if it didn't work in black and white, it wasn't going to work in color later on. Uh, that may or may not be true for you, but it works for me. Another uh, reason to print these in black and white or to create these in black and white is the same professor used to have another saying about printing out your logo designs on eight and a half by 11 paper, taping them to the wall, and walking back across to the other side of the room and checking to see if your logo designs are still legible because of course legibility is a primary concern with logo design um, unless you're designing I don't know death metal logos because it, when we tape these to the other side of the room and you're looking at them from a distance logos need to be functional both enormously big and very tiny so I don't know if someday this logo, you know, it could be on a billboard for a movie or it might just be on a teeny tiny little sticker. Either way, the logo has to be uh, legible and it has to work. So if you'd like more tips on this stuff, um, you can read my book, The Essential Guide to Comic Book Lettering, published by Image. Um, so let's, let's dive into this a little bit. So we're going to start over here and spoiler alert, this is option one and it did not get used, but uh, it's a good example of what to do and what not to do. So as I always do with any logo project, um, I immerse myself in research materials and going into this, all I really knew about it was that it was a horror Western um, and I think I had the cover image. Uh, drawn by Jorge, and I had the pitch that Scotty sent to Image when he was pitching the book. So I knew a little bit about what was going on. Now, I'm a big fan of horror to begin with, so I have lots of horror reference material both in my brain and in the uh, Blambot Studio Library. But I don't know a whole lot about Western stuff, American Western designs. Um, so I had to dig into a bunch of reference material both in the physical world and online and I looked at things like old Western action magazines and the title cards from um, you know Sergio Leone Western movies because I don't like just sitting down at a computer at a blank screen and trying to force something to happen um, I find most of the time things don't work out and if they if I even generate anything at all So I like to do a lot of design work in my head before I ever sit down at a computer uh, Or a drafting board if I'm sketching um, Because at least then I have a direction, you know, I have some sort of um, Key that unlocks the door to step into this design and keep going and once you have that first idea uh, the rest of the ideas seem to just roll along, at least for me anyway. So let's dig into this first option here. This is option one. And normally when I would start a logo design, uh, I would try to avoid fonts as much as possible, even my own fonts, because I figure my client wants something wholly original. So I'll take my sketches or my idea and bring them into Illustrator and create vectors. So my uh, initial approach, which I mean, this is deceptively simple. Um, I would just create letters with objects, and you can see these are just rectangles and squares that I may have slightly modified to create the shape. And once I have something I'm happy with in this stage, I unite everything together. So now this is all just one object. And this logo is distressed, clearly, if we zoom in back here. So my next step before I start distressing things would be to round all the corners a little bit. You can see how rounded these are. Now we need to distress this. So I've come up with a few uh, techniques for distressing. 
Um, some are probably better than others, and I'm sure there are many more that I haven't thought of. Now, the first and most obvious would be to use the roughen effect in Illustrator, which seems like it would be made you know, perfectly just for this kind of a use. But sometimes I feel like roughen's effects are a little questionable, and I have to do a lot of cleanup. And while it does have its uses, I don't feel like this is one of them, at least not for me. So another option would be to zoom way, way in, uh, switch to the pen tool, and use this outline sort of as a guide to just tap, tap, tap until you have something like this, which you can see is like that or like that. And it's okay. It works pretty well. There's less cleanup than roughing. Um, but it takes a long time to do every letter that way. So the third way I thought of would be to create a custom Illustrator brush that has a very organic edge to it and apply that to every letter. Um, that may be more work than you're willing to do, especially if you don't, you're not comfortable designing your own brushes. I mean, you could probably buy some. But let's start talking about uh, sort of the, the the design inspiration for these things and, and how I thought this through. So this was my initial idea. You know, these letters are obviously extended, which is um, a little outside my comfort zone. You, you can, if you follow my work online, you probably know that I do more condensed letters than extended. So I thought I'd push myself outside of my comfort zone even a little bit more. Um, so this was my initial idea. And here I start putting it on black and, and backgrounds and of different kinds. Uh, this idea turned into these two ideas, which is just the only difference really is the underline. I, I actually like the underline better, I think. And I added just a little bit of texture here. You can see this vector texture. And I go out in the wild and take lots of photos when I find textures I think will be useful. And I bring them back into Illustrator and vectorize them. So I have a whole hard drive full of, um, you know, all kinds of weird photos of things that could be interesting textures. So I showed this to Scotty and Jorge, and the response was kind of, you know, it was kind of meh. Um, and they asked for something else. What can you add to this? So against my better judgment, and if you've read my book, uh, you know that I'm not thrilled with doing this, but... I started working in some iconography into the A here because I have this this nice space that we can uh, exploit for uh, in some sort of drawing. And all I knew at the beginning of this was that the art that I had seen um, involved a graveyard, and you'll see that artwork later on in the, this video. So I started working in these gravestones, and then when I showed them this, they brought up the good point. Um, you know, we did. We decided we didn't want any religious iconography in the logo, which is totally valid. Um, this, these two options are my least favorite options of this entire design process because I don't like working in or shoehorning in uh, drawings into my logo designs. I figure that's it's too much. It's what uh, my design professor used to call ten pounds of shit in a five pound bag. So, my next idea was to uh, create this, which is basically was supposed to be symbolic of an eclipse. There was an eclipse that happens that I read about in the synopsis of the pitch. And so I drew this uh, probably on Bristol board with a marker, scanned it, vectorized it, dropped it behind the logo. And before I ever even showed it to anybody, I realized, no, this looks too much like uh, the bottom of a wet coffee cup stain on a piece of paper or something. So I don't even think I, sh I don't know if I showed them that one or not. Um, so by now I kind of felt like uh, we're failing. I keep coming up with ideas and now I'm torturing this logo into things it shouldn't be. And um, so I, I gave it one last effort. And this, this design up here is basically just this, this one right here, the initial underlying design. And I thought, well, let me sharpen the corners and see if that makes it look a little more um, like a, something horrific or something from a horror movie. And it didn't, but it was interesting. Um, I changed the apostrophe too. You can see the apostrophe changed. So that didn't work either. 
And my last uh, attempt with this logo option was what I call the grave dirt underline. I changed the underline into this uh, textured um, slash right here. And my inspiration for this was, if you've ever seen a movie where the camera pans down through the ground and you have grass and then, you know, like the roots of the grass and dirt and stones and bones and things, um, that was kind of what I was going for here. Not sure which textures I used for this. I think I used maybe two or three different ones that I put together. Um, but in the end, none of this was used. Um, nobody was really jazzed about it. And uh, we move on to logo design two. Here we are at option two. Um, and I decided to scrap option one because it wasn't going anywhere and I was just making too many edits to it and it just wasn't working out. So there comes a time when you just have to start over. You've got to, you know, just accept the fact that you did all that work and it's not going to get used. Although later on I will show you how it did sort of get reused because you should never throw away your old ideas. So anyway, option two here, I started, started the same way. Um, you know, these are all just objects that I cobbled together to make letters, and I'm, we're back to sort of a condensed look. And these are just the unified letters. And these are, this is my building block. This is my way into this design. I just started, I decided to focus on the word grave. So once again, uh, we distressed a little bit, rounded the corners, um, you know, and for this one, I think I used that third uh, option that I gave you with the Adobe Illustrator brush. I have several brushes that look like they are sort of um, janky old pen nibs, and they sort of have a rough line to them, and that worked really well for this. So after that, I thought uh, my initial idea would be to add some texture of like wooden slats. Yeah, and I'm thinking old wooden signs in the Old West, that kind of thing. So I started making these long lines through each letter. And clearly I never even got past the G because I didn't think this was working out. So I just abandoned this. I don't think anybody saw this option because clearly it's not even finished. So then we went to a different texture. Um, and this one I think is a bit excessive. It's probably too much. But... Uh, you can see here some examples of those textures I was talking about. This one, I think, was um, a picture of some icy slush that I took with my phone, and then I brought it into Illustrator and vectorized it. And this might have been the concrete floor of my garage. I'm not sure. I'd have to look up the file names. But anyway, um, so this wasn't working for me either. I don't think I showed that to anybody. And so I started this. And this texture is sort of a riff on this. This wasn't working. This is a wood texture. Um, I had some pictures of some old wood, uh, an old wooden floor. And I snipped out little bits of the texture and just applied them. And I, I sort of did away with the idea of having lines like slats. And just sort of this, this once I started laying down this texture, it took on a life of its own. I knew exactly what it should have looked like. And so I kept adding little bits of these effects, these uh, little wood textures, until I thought, yep, that's it. I'm done. That's good. You can also see I finally included the first two words, ain't no, which uh, is a simpler design than the previous. Um, I wouldn't call that exten extended, but it's certainly not condensed. It's sort of somewhere in between. Um, so that I was really happy with. And this, I wanted to show Scotty and Jorge this, but I also wanted to give them a slight modification of this. And the only difference between these two is that you can see the bottom edge of this version has a slight arc to it. And I showed them both, and in the end, they liked just the straight bottom one version better. And that's what we ended up going with. So let's see, I've got a file here called Logo Final. This is what I showed them um, for the final draft. Here it is on a black background. Here it is on a white background. 
Here it is on a gray background. And for the gray background, you can see I put just a little bit of a drop shadow down here. If this is going to be uh, appearing against some very complicated artwork, as it, it will, you'll see in a minute, um, I thought I would just pull out that little trick to sort of separate it from the background just a little bit, just a tiny bit. And you got to think, this is only going to be, um, you know, maybe four inches across on the cover of a comic. So, so that slight drop shadow uh, won't be overwhelmingly, you know, it just, it won't, it won't be a focus. So at the end of this, um, I, the, the next tip I have for you is that if you want to sell a design or sell all of your designs in the comics industry, if you're doing logos, a really great idea is to present the logo options on a cover, the actual cover art, if you can get it. If you can't get it, um, back when I designed a bunch of logos for Marvel, I couldn't get the final covers that the logos were going to be on, so I would grab some other covers um, that didn't have any trade dress. But in this case, I actually had, let's see, where is it? Solicit final. Here's the cover drawn by Jorge. And you can see, uh, I didn't really need to use any color on this cover. It, it's just, it looks better with just white letters on this beautifully colored cover by uh, Jean. And this is the version which has got the little bit of a drop shadow just to separate it from all this busy, all the busy inks back here. And it wasn't my idea to put this logo in the middle of this character's chest. Um, that was Jorge's idea from the beginning. So I, I felt bad about covering up artwork. Uh, so this is the solicit cover. So solicits are what you submit to like the uh, previews catalog in order to sell your comic. And, and that all comes out three months before it goes on, on stands. So the covers and the the production design you see on the cover or the placements of things tend to change between solicits and the final cover. And that is the case here. So uh, all this cover dress, and uh, maybe I should explain cover dress. Um, cover dress is everything but the cover artwork that's placed here by the letterer or the production department at the publisher. So that would be the logo, the publisher's mark, in this case image, the uh, issue number and the price, and of course, uh, creator credits. And here's, uh, remember I said earlier where you shouldn't throw away your unused ideas? So do you remember uh, the first idea, the first option, which was logo one, the word grave. I really like these letters. I didn't want to not use them for anything. So basically I finished the alphabet. I designed all the numbers and punctuation and a bunch of different options. And I, I designed a font. Um, so that font became what's called uh, Circling Vultures, and I think I released that at the end of 2023. But you can see here, it's an actual live font. I can go in, I can type, you know, whatever I want. So, don't throw away your old ideas. You can always recycle them into something else. So this was the solicit cover, which doesn't, it's not actually going to be the final cover of the book that um, so after the solicits were done we kind of revisited this whole cover and said okay what do you want to do for the trade dress or for the cover dress so initially Scotty said let's put all our names at the four corners and sometimes you don't know really how things are going to look until you actually design them and show them to everybody and in this case we all kind of said eh I'm not really thrilled with that it looks kind of strange I mean it's a nice balance because we've got the logo in the center but I don't know, it's just not working. So uh, Jorge said, why don't we put all our names in the upper right corner? And I tried a version of that with this, and it's, it is nice and clean. However, I feel like this doesn't quite work because of the restrictions of our guides. And let me turn those back on. See the blue lines here? Those are our guides. So this outer blue line represents the trim. This is where the cover is going to get cut when it actually goes through the printing process. This inner line is the safe area, so all your lettering needs to be on the inside of that line, which kind of limits us as far as how big these credits can be. So that's okay, it didn't thrill anybody. 
So I, I kept thinking about it and I thought, well, here's another option. Option C, which I think is the one we're actually going to go with. We don't have confirmation yet from everybody, but everybody seems really happy with this. Um, I put our credits right under the logo. Um, might as well use up some more of that center space since we're doing it anyway, right? And that, I think, is going to be the finished logo. Uh, I mean, sorry, the finished cover for issue one. For subsequent issues, I think we're going to move the logo back up to the top where it would normally be. But we wanted to do something special for this one. And I think that's it. I think that's about all I have for you on the subject of Ain't No Grave. Um, thanks for watching, and I appreciate you tuning in. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks.